This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good morning and welcome to and beyond Ngala, everyone from all over the world. We've got quite a stunning morning here today. It is rather cold. My hands are in my fleece pockets. It's been a chilly morning so far. But it is a rather beautiful start to the day. And we have come down to the southern part of Angola to try to see if we can find some tracks of that part of the Birmingham Pride that we started off yesterday afternoon looking for. As I said, when you do try to track them in the morning, it's a little bit easier because you've got a little bit more light to work with and you can spend a bit more time searching for them. So similar to yesterday, we have headed into the southern part and once again, we have not yet seen an animal. So the south has been rather quiet over the last couple of days, but I'm sure as it warms up and as we move further south into some of the areas where there's a few more clearings, we will hopefully come across something nice. But it is a rather beautiful setting to start. Just like yesterday, we started with a scenic view. This morning, we started with a little bit of a different view. We're looking more in a northerly direction, and those blue hills that you can see all in the background there are all part of the Kruger National Park just shows you the size and still very green so it is a rather beautiful spot on our property to to stop and have a look especially in the morning with the light shining on those little hills in the distance this morning we've got lauren and, and steve at juma um dev at pinda jp at pridelands and deirdre at swalu so i'm sure the guys and girls across all the different locations will be able to find us some rather interesting things this morning. Then when we stopped here, we did hear some elephants trumpeting to our west or to our left, pretty much behind us. But welcome aboard your live safari from the African wild. A few birds calling this moon this this morning we've got a few ringneck doves calling behind us and it's quite an interesting morning considering how cold it is but my name is nick and behind camera we've got him poor this morning and we're very glad to be joining everyone today hopefully it is a good day all round um, as I mentioned, we're probably going to start heading down into the south to look for tracks of the lions. But just in the time being, we just decided to spend a bit of time here. It's always nice to just turn off the vehicle and not have the, the noise of the engine and the, the wheels going on the road. It, you won't believe how loud this vehicle can be when it's moving. So it's nice to just turn off, especially in the morning with the birds start calling, and just listen. There might be clues around us that may alert us to various different animals and birds, whether it's their, their call of the birds or maybe an impala or kudu alarming that will alert us to a predator. And it's just nice to start off in a little peaceful spot like this. Last night we didn't hear too much activity around, or at least around the Angala tented camp. There were a few hyenas calling, but I didn't hear the lions. So we think the, the two dominant males might be in the far western part of the reserve at the moment, maybe checking up on the other pride that they are in control of, or dominant over, which is the Birmingham Breakaway Pride. And Dyke said when he was at his drink stop, he actually heard what sounded like mating lions not far from where he was. He did try and find them, but was unable to, but he was pretty pretty certain that he heard lions mating, which is exciting news for us. There are cubs in pretty much all of the prides around the property at the moment, some of them being a little bit more challenging to find than others. But the 
the sun rising up a little bit higher is starting to warm up quite nicely for us. I couldn't agree more. It is such a beautiful clear morning safari kitty. And I just love the, the color on those hills at the back when you start to see that blue. It's sort of like a dark blue as the, the bush rolls into the distance. Miles and miles of Africa. And yeah, yesterday we also got quite a nice viewpoint in, in the afternoon to start off our drive at Ngala. So nice to have another viewpoint. I mean, in all honesty, these are probably the two viewpoints that we have on the property. The rest of the property is rather flat. So it was just right place at the right time. But I think what we're going to do, we're going to continue driving along this road in front of us and, and check some of the water holes along our eastern boundary just in case maybe the lions have headed that way to have a drink at some stage last night. Maybe if we're very lucky, we'll find them lying at the, the water's edge. Um, sometimes if they catch something in the evening, then they look for water to go and have a drink. And in the south, there are a few little ponds of water, but not, not too many small pans. So there's a good chance that they might move towards one of the bigger watering holes. But let's keep driving and check what we can find. You never know, it could be anything around the next corner. continuing along this road and there is lots of dew in the grass and if you want to send any questions or comments you can send them through on the hashtag wild earth or head over to the live stream where you can comment on the live safari page and then I think it's kids questions at wildearth.tv Hopefully we'll hear some nice questions and comments throughout the drive. Keen to engage with, with some of you this morning and get involved in some nice conversations, essentially. Always love getting interesting questions and, and the lovely comments. Keeps us sane out here. Otherwise, it's just me and Paul chatting to each other the whole drive. There's still a little bit of water on the road in front of us here. So James, we haven't really been seeing, or we actually have just started being seeing mist in the mornings, but we haven't seen it too much over the last while. I think as we get more and more into the winter period, or as autumn starts to, to finish and we head into winter, we will see the mist more and more. I don't think it has a huge impact on the animal behavior. I just think it, with it being a little bit cooler in the morning with the mist, um, some of the, the predators might move a little bit more. So some of the, the lions and leopards, you might see them moving around a little bit more in the early hours of the morning when the sun's come up because of it being a little bit cooler. And who knows, if it is very dense mist, uh, we don't get the thickest mist here at Ingala, but if it is dense mist, maybe the animals will be able to make use of it as cover to try and stalk other animals. I think for impala, rhino, elephant, the mist doesn't bother them too much. They don't worry about it too much and um, might make them a little bit jittery for something like a herd of impala if they're standing in a thick belt of mist but as i said the mist here we don't get it's not not incredibly thick so you can still see about 30 meters when it is close to the thickest um, and then on these ridges like where we are at the moment that's when the mist you tend to not see too much mist it's mainly down in the drainage lines and in the little valleys like where we were looking now, just before we started driving towards those blue hills in the background, if it was a misty morning, you'd see all the drainage lines have like almost a sheet of mist over them. So in there, maybe maybe the animals feel a little bit more nervous, but I don't think it changes behavior much. There was a bird of prey in a murder tree, but it's just flown off. And there is a water hole coming up on our right-hand side shortly. Again, I'm not expecting to find anything around it, but it would be nice. Just sneak past this cluster leaf that the elephants have pushed over. And I'm sure some of you that were watching the other day, you would have seen Marcus here with the, the, the lines that we're looking for this morning, the group with the white lines in. 
It's not the prettiest water hole I've ever seen. It is actually an old quarry, but it holds water quite nicely throughout the winter. So it tends to be quite a hot spot as we get into the drier, drier part of the year. Oof, I'm sure Mpo agrees with me, but it is very, very nice to be in the sun. <laughs> it's much, much warmer than where we were in the drainage line earlier. But I'll just reposition around this water hole and then we can stop and have a quick look around the dam. So Lulu, a lot of it has to do with, with our activity in the vehicles. Yesterday we drove the whole south pretty much and we found the tracks and most of them we drove over them. And then you can imagine other animals walking over them. So if they on top and there's no animals, no birds over the tracks, you know that then they're quite fresh. Um, if you're finding tracks of genets and, and civets and some of the nocturnal creatures over the tracks, then you know they might be from early last night. And yeah, it's also depending on the crispness of the track. So if it's really crisp and the ridges around the track are quite prominent and, and the wind hasn't blown them over and the sun and the heat hasn't let the sand or taken away the Christmas from the track, that's when you know that they're nice and fresh and they might be worth following. On a morning like today when there's lots of dew in the grass as well, if you look on the tracks very carefully, sometimes you can see the moisture in the tracks, then you know they're very, very fresh because those animals would have come out the grass when it is wet and then walked on the road and the moisture hasn't evaporated from the track yet. But I think let's have a quick look around this watering hole. I can't even see a bird, to be honest. I did hear a, a blacksmith lapwing when we arrived, but I think it flew away. But I'm just having a quick squiz with my binoculars to see, but there is absolutely nothing here. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll keep going. There is a vehicle driving past in front of us. Um, and as I mentioned, it is our eastern boundary and it is one of the main access roads into Kruger Park. So we might see a, a private vehicle or two on the way down. It's just part of these reserves and it's also, it's quite a good thing because it allows all different people from all walks of life to be able to come and explore these nature areas. The Kruger Park's a great area to do that where you can self-drive and you go in on your own in, in your private vehicle. Won't be a car like this that's open and you also won't be allowed to drive off road, which is also very good for the animals because sometimes the Kruger does get rather full and then if the animals are really not interested in, in the 10 cars that are trying to look at them, they can just walk off the road and then they can get away from the vehicles. Animals that are in Gaal are not that fortunate with us being allowed off-road. They can't just escape us. But if we do see that they don't really want the vehicles around, then we pull out. We don't want to put pressure on them. It's not why we're here. Here's a little bird party on our right of a whole array of different species trying to make use of the morning sun to try and heat up. And if you look at that one on the far left-hand side with the very long tail, just the only bird of that species that's in the tree, that is a magpie shrike. And then if you listen carefully, that is from a southern red-billed hornbill. And there's also some virtual starlings that are in the tree as well. But what we're going to do, we're going to, as I said, let's just go, we're going to head into the, the further into the south of Ingala and try to see if we can pick up on the tracks of this pride of lions. But for now, we're going to send you over to Deirdre and her intro at Swalu. Good morning from Swalu. This uh, gentleman has just uh, had his dust bath for the morning. Uh, if he does turn around, we might see some nice red sand uh, on his face while he was uh, kicking up the sand and having a good uh, roll. Now he's uh, ready for his uh, morning, and so are we. You're with me, Deirdre, and on camera this morning, BK. Uh, we don't really have a plan. We're just going to bumble, see uh, if we can get into the areas where there's good possibilities for cheetah. And, uh, yeah, that's our, that's our morning. It's not uh, too cold, which is uh, a nice start to the day. He's he stopped and he's staring at something, so there might be something. Oh no, there he goes.
There we go, he's found a new nice dust patch. Oh no, that's uh, a nice dust patch to roll in there. He's probably, you might see some red f sand flying up. So they'll have these little uh, open clearings near the trees that they'll uh, scent mark with their faces. Uh, rub their face up and down, there's a gland on their face uh, and these nice little uh, dust patches that they like to defecate in and sometimes roll in as well. Jackson is asking the question, why are they always found alone? So territorial bulls, they choose to stay in one area and mark and protect that area. Hopefully they've got good food and good water. Uh, and then in the breeding season, when the females move into their area, they try and get, uh, they try and keep them. So that's why you'll find uh, bulls on their own. Sometimes younger bulls will be sort of in a little bachelor group if there's, um, uh, they're not old enough to own territory yet, but um, they've been uh, booted out of the herd, then uh, you'll find the little bachelor groups. We're going to go forward a little bit. There's uh, quite a lot of activity at the sociable weaver's nest. They're waking up this morning, so they're making a lot of noise. They're about to get, uh, about to get busy this morning. So we'll just uh, show you that. And then after that, we're going to send you across to Dev, who wants to say good morning as well. Welcome to uh, and beyond Pinder this morning, everyone. We have got a beautiful overcast morning. It's really nice and cloudy it's nice and cool the temperature is still really nice and low from yesterday afternoon and yesterday's heat it's an absolute treat uh, we've come west to look for lions and we came across this tree not far away from a watering hole it is absolutely laden with white black vultures you can see the area that we're in is very nice and tree there's some tall trees over here around and along the drainage line my name's Devin behind the camera we've got Odie this morning he's doing all the important bits and I'm just driving around <laughs> and this yeah very very cool to see so we came along here yesterday evening if you're with us then and um saw one or two we didn't see this many vultures but one or two vultures that were well, had been at a little watering hole having a drink. This is now on the other side of the valley, or other side of the valley to where we were yesterday. And so I think what happened is probably all these vultures that we're seeing in the trees here now, later yesterday afternoon, came down to have a drink. And then from the drink, they weren't going to be flying anymore for the day. So they came up into these trees and just parked off. Look how special that is. Endangered animals, two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven, another three and another tree. Very, very special sight to see. We are going to keep moving, looking for lions, and we'll hopefully be coming back to you quite shortly with them. But until then... Good morning everybody, welcome to Juma, welcome to a, well, a beautiful scene. If you are against um, dead animals, it's probably a good opportunity to look away. We have relocated on Tlalamba who is up the tree, is he moving her impala carcass around somewhat. was in some gorgeous lights a moment ago. Hello everybody, my name is Steve, joined by Davis on camera and is always very excited to be with us. Now, we are with Tlalamba, she's in a beautiful jackalberry tree, the light is 
absolutely gorgeous. Unfortunately, she just moved now. She was sitting in a perfect little fork there for us. Now she's decided she wants to move further back. Maybe she's worried the kill is about to fall. Should I move back, Darby? Get that little angle there. Ah, oh, there we go. There's the beautiful. She's like, who? Me? Yeah, that's what I thought. Just going to move back. Such. Light is on the other side now. Tell me when. Hello, my beautiful girl. What a perfect tree for a leopard to hoist to kill in. We always see these big jackalberries and we just wonder how many leopards have over the life of that tree had a kill in them. Look at the heat coming off of her nose there. She blows off to the right. It's a chilly morning. We arrived here, found her on the ground. She gave us a few cursory yawns and then scratched a bit on a smaller tree and then up she went effortlessly. James, it's always nice to start the morning with spots. There's one of the benefits of leopards hoisting kills is you can almost guarantee to find them the next day, but when it's up a tree like this, it's generally the case. Leopards with inexperienced cubs or leopards that don't hoist their kills often lose them. Inexperienced cubs often drop them to the ground don't even know if hyenas have been on the scene here. Normally you'd find at least one or two hanging around at the base, waiting to pick up whatever falls down. You want to know if they ever leave and don't come back? Well, not normally, but uh, Mawati seemed to abandon his kill in the south. The Warthog kill. I haven't been back in a few days, but we went a few times. It's not. Good morning and welcome to Wild Earth. We are live at Pridelands and we've already started our bushwalk. Our plans for this morning is to scour the plains area where we are and to work some of the drainage lines. My name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we've got Johan. But in the meanwhile we would like to point out the beauty of the Drakensberg Mountains which is in the distance. So one of the highest points which you can see at the moment is known as Marib's Corp. The section of a Drakensberg that we see over here is named after one of the prominent chiefs that used to live in this area many years ago. The point which you can see is approximately 1,943 meters above sea level and provides some of the finest views onto the Lofeld region of South Africa. Her early start will lead you up to the top of this mountain and it's always a good thing to take a flask of coffee and wait for the sun to rise. 
But Drakensberg Mountain is also one of our longest mountain ranges in South Africa and stretches out from all the way from the Eastern Cape province right through into the Limpopo province. While you're enjoying the views, we're going to start getting ready to set off on our walk. Nestled on the banks of one of the largest lakes in the Sabi Sands lies an award-winning game lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. Many of you will have been on safari here virtually with Wild Earth, but now we are offering you the chance to see it for yourself in person. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the end of April and you and a friend could win three nights to this luxury lodge. In addition to the unforgettable safaris, you can unwind on the deck, relax in the pool, and even savor the various bush dining experiences. Chitwa's holistic approach to hospitality, with specific emphasis on conservation, will leave you with the very best memories of the African wild. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. I'm just going to see there's a very good place that I want to see if we can get good signal from there. That's what I'd like to know. Welcome to Dawn in the African Bush. How cool is this? Can you believe it? Those cubs are now only 10 feet from us. Unbelievable. Elephants chasing wild dogs, wild dogs chasing elephants. Pandemonium! Watching how Wild Earth has grown since 2007 has been truly remarkable. On the 27th of April this year, Wild Earth will be turning 14 and we would love to hear from you. Please send us your own special birthday message which we can share with the rest of the Wild Earth family. Maybe you can tell us why you started watching Wild Earth, what Wild Earth means to you, or you could just send us a very happy birthday. Don't forget when you want to film yourself to hold your phone sideways to get the best angle. When you are ready, you can email your videos through to birthday at wildearth.tv. Hi, my name is Tristan Dix and I am a guide here at Juma Private Game Reserve for Wild Earth. We love connecting you to the African bush and we always look forward to all of your questions. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you'll need to register on the website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit a question below the live feed. Catch up with me on Wild Earth. <laughs> We've managed to find a very cooperative bird this morning that has been sitting there for probably the last two to three minutes. <clears throat> and how... Uh, well, it has moved now into the top of the tree and the colours might be, and it's a little bit hidden in the canopy, but the colours might be a bit brighter with it being sitting in the sun, but it is a beautiful lilac-breasted roller this morning and we found it, it was on the road, it was looking to try catch maybe a grasshopper or an insect and as we disturbed it, it flew up into the tree and it's moved to the top of that russet bush well now, trying to get nice and warm. And just back to last night, I got a question about chameleons and them blinking. They do not blink as they've only got one cone-shaped eyelid which is fused to their eyeball and ends up covering the entire eyeball. This in turn only leaves a tiny opening um, which exposes the pupil. However, last night we did see they can close their eyes when they sleep. Um, and then within that eyelid and the eyeball, there's a small membrane called the nictating membrane that acts similar to an eyelid. And I think that's what happens when they close their eyes. So just it's a little bit of interesting information regarding the chameleons that we were seeing last night. With this lilac breasted roller, it's on its own this morning, but they are usually found either on their own or in pairs. 
and it is one of the more beautiful birds that does not leave us in the wintertime. Most of the other colorful birds that migrate down from from central parts of Africa, northern Africa, and Europe are the rather colorful ones, European bee eaters, southern carmine bee eaters, the woodland kingfishers. So this is pretty much one of our last remaining colorful birds that we will see throughout the winter. Another one off the top of my head that we might think of is something like a little bee eater that is also rather beautiful. But I think with that uh, roller tucked in the top of the canopy and not having the best view of it, let's keep checking this road down towards the next watering hole. We have passed another one in the drainage line behind us. <clears throat> and there was nothing there. <laughs> I was hoping maybe we'd see some white-faced whistling ducks. But we're going to send you over to Steve at Juma. just pushed forward. <laughs> it's another cat just looking right into the sun. Well, I hope you can all see the leopard. So Patterson wanted to know about leopards leaving kills and we lost you during my answer there, so I don't know how much we got, but I'm just still trying to regain my sight. Um, so Mawati left a water kill on us sort of close to the southern boundary. It's been there for at least a week already, maybe more. Uh, why he left it, it's really hard to say. Um, leopards don't normally abandon kills. Uh, maybe something else happened, he found another kill, but he would have come back by now, so it'll be worth checking up. But uh, maybe he likes um, some sun-dried warthog. He likes it to dry out a bit more. Um, there's also the potential, without being negative in any way, that he got killed um, by something along the, the way, and that would be a reason for him not to come back. But for the most part, they generally know when they've got food and they don't generally go very far from their food. Like columba has been here for a few days already. Uh, they generally will defend their food against others. It's taken them a fair bit of energy to catch the food. And so they will, um, they will use all of their energy to stay here. But I, I haven't in the past seen leopards abandoning kills. There are obviously in areas where obviously when it's a leopard's not very relaxed um, you might find a kill and no leopard there and that leopard won't come back until it feels it's safe to come back uh, and generally after dark they'll come back but uh, they, they won't abandon it for that long. So even in past when I've had uh, very skittish leopards they generally always come back at night. So I can't think of any other reason why he could have abandoned that warthog. Davi, have you experienced that before here, Juma? Yeah, I have. You have? Mm. Just completely abandoned? Randomly, not often. It might be sort of to the point where there's not much meat left on a carcass and they find something better. They spend time on that. But um, I've seen Tingana come back, I don't know how long after, and he found some, some meat which was more like some tanned leather in the tree that he climbed up and fed on. So he probably knew it was still there. But it wasn't really worth going back to at the time. And then he was just a little bit peckish, so he pulled in for a snack. But uh, to leave a substantial amount of meat, so it's not very common. And that's probably three, three days now, if I recall. Funduti found it, it was Friday, Friday morning. It's the fourth day now. So she's been eating it at leisure, no one's stolen it. Taken her time. exactly how she likes it and that's why sometimes we don't find leopards for a few days after rainfall events after very windy conditions because they find a kill or they get a kill in the middle of a block somewhere where there's possibly water 
and there's no need for them to come out for three, four days. No need at all. They'll just sit there and enjoy. Lumber means playful, a rebellious one, a mixture of the two. Um, I think it was first given as a playful, and it's turned out to be a little bit more rebellious. It's a bit of the of both. The playful, rebellious one, who has always been very playful. She was an only child, so she used to play a lot. As soon as mum would come back, she'd be full of energy, and she used to drive her mum a little bit crazy. His mum was the centre of attention, of course, Tundi. She hadn't seen anybody, hadn't played with any other thing for a while. And then mum would arrive back and all Tundi wanted to do was sleep or rest. And this little one wanted to have as much fun as she possibly could, make up for the time lost. Yeah, but now there's a fair amount of disease that can be transferred through these populations, but for the most part, the animals that have survived have developed immunity to, to many of the diseases that are transferred through. Um, those who, who don't do very well with the diseases end up succumbing to them and not breeding. So over many, many years, the natural diseases that these areas sort of have, animals get quite used to. Um, but there is... There's a lot of research going into both vine tuberculosis, which is being transferred to lions, and to leopards who are scavenging off of buffalo carcasses. And uh, that's definitely having an impact. TB sort of shortens the life of these individuals. It weakens them to a point. It doesn't really show immediately, but after a period of time, after a few unsuccessful hunts, they so start getting a little bit older, and they don't recover as quickly, and the... TB starts to show its signs. The light's just coming in from a bit of an angle there, so... Okay, well, we're going to stay here with Salamba. In the meantime, send you over to Ambion Pinder. So we have continued down in the direction of the lions that we're looking for this morning. And we came around a corner and there was this big grey shape standing in the middle of the road, flapping its ears. <laughs> this is uh, an elephant bull that we found. Quite relaxed at the moment, he's just slowly cooling himself. There you can see his ears moving up and down while he feeds. Um, the grass in this area, you can see on that tree how nice and lush and green everything is at the moment. Um, we've had a lot of rain here and the grass that he's busy feeding on now, you can see his trunk is just getting down there, getting the good green stuff at the bottom. Um, and really enjoying, you can see, you can hear him it's actually pulling up large clumps of grass. just hear something in front of us here. I think there might be another elephant on the other side of this tree. <laughs> oh, there he is. 
showing us his face now. And beautiful texture on his trunk. You can see the grass sticking out the side of his mouth there. <laughs> We've been ambushed by another elephant just up over here. <laughs> so this one has actually, you can see, let's stop here and have a look. His tusks have, looks like they're really, really short. I think the one on the right might have broken off. You can just see it sticking out there. And a little bit darker in color to the other one. So elephant's color really depends on what they've been, what type of mud and sand they've been wallowing in and washing themselves and bathing in. Oh, beautiful long eyelashes there as well. You can see this guy is feeding on small little shrubs that he's pulling out. And yeah, keep coming back here before we get surrounded. It's gonna have to stay with me for a second. Losing the road. Really, really beautiful to see these two big males. They're just slowly moving along and feeding. Very, very relaxed. Oh, you can see how he... JP, uh, no, not necessarily common. I think this elephant, so he's got tusks. They're just incredibly short. Um, and that could have been either a birth defect, it could be the genetics, or he could have possibly broken them. Um, elephants use their tusks for a whole number of different, I suppose, tasks. They really use them as tools. Oh, he's lining this tree up here. I wonder if he's going to have a scratch. So I wouldn't say common to see elephants without tusks, but here on Pinda there are a couple of individuals who don't have tusks. So there's a tree that's fallen over on the left of this elephant and he's just using it to scratch his back left leg. <laughs> really getting in there. Quite an amazing sound of the skin rubbing against the bark. <laughs> oh, it's going to feed a little bit as he goes. You can see how much control he's got over that trunk now. Pulling that branch and the whole tree shakes. So these older bulls are really enjoying this part of the reserve at the moment. And all the rain we've had, the grass is green, the trees are lush, the leaves are green. So for them to be here at this time of year is really, there's lots and lots of food around, there's lots of water around. So they've got everything they need. Sabian, um, I suppose there's uh, no, it's a very dexterous, mobile thing. Kind of like your knuckles on your joints, the skin's not smooth over them. So, all those wrinkles come from moving. The 
the trunk in all different directions, almost like wrinkles. Smile lines, except these are wrinkles from feeding and drinking and running around and having a good time. Elephants will often use their tusks, so when they're feeding on trees, they'll often use their tusks to lift a little bit of bark before using their trunk to pull the bark off and strip it off the tree. And they use it for other things like tearing off branches and breaking branches and grasses and all sorts. I often wonder if these individuals that don't have tusks are disadvantaged at all. If they, if they feel like they're not. If you watch them though, they don't seem to be too worried about it. Oh, I'm pulling up all the grass now. He's smelling the grass. Oh, little eye rub. And there he goes, trunk up. Having a little bit of a smell. These two bulls, I don't know. I wonder if they're going to have any sort of interaction now. Odette, if you ever see elephants and lions in the same sighting or interacting, uh, <laughs> I think you are quite correct. They uh, will send lions running in all directions. Little trumpet, a flap of the ears and a short charge and a lion will go. Highly mobile in the opposite direction. As part of the reserve, we are got a few kind of dry rivers, low, slightly lower lying areas that run through this area. And that's why we've got all these slightly larger trees here. Oh, look at that. To a... Uh, Very, very special. Daniela, elephants are mixed feeders, so they feed on grasses and trees. And when I say trees, lots of branches, lots of leaves. They'll eat lots of fruit as well. We often see different seeds in their dung, which is quite interesting because they actually form quite important carriers for seeds for distributing them to different areas where that tree might not be not yet growing. As far as a favorite food goes, I think if it's green and lush, it'll be enjoyed quite, quite a lot. Um, I haven't noticed any particular food or food groups that they prefer. These older bulls tend to prefer eating grass. Um, as their teeth wear down they find it harder and harder to chew branches and larger twigs and things and they will feed more on grass because it's softer easier to digest but you can see so this bull this is the first one that we saw now has gone from feeding on grass to feeding on a tree back to feeding on all the small little shrubs that were shooting up through the grass and now he's gone back to a tree again so he's really really mixing it up we're gonna leave these two bulls now they are most likely just gonna carry on 
as they are, for, and as we've seen them doing for the rest of the morning. They might have a drink a little bit later, but I'm still quite keen to try to find those lions. So we're going to carry on heading in that direction, and we'll be back with you a little bit later. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. So in 1998, we had this idea to go and put a live web camera on a waterhole somewhere in the Sabi Sands next to the Kruger National Park. And I approached just about every single landowner and everybody thought I was completely crazy until I met Yuri and Pippa Moorman. We thought it was definitely a fun idea and a worthwhile thing to experiment. And it immediately became a runaway success. And it gave people all around the world the opportunity to watch a little piece of Africa day and night. Back in 1998, it was the very early stages of the internet. And all we were able to do was to get a 30 second refreshing JPEG out of that camera. But over time, what we began to do is focus more and more on trying to develop this concept of giving people the opportunity to go on safari. Even though we live just 500 meters up this hill, we still put the camera on to see what's happening. Absolutely, we watch it <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> I'm Nikki here at Ambion Ngala in South Africa. I love getting questions from viewers about all the small things within the environment and how it all is integrated with one another. If you want to ask me any questions, please simply register with the Wild Earth website, head across to the Live Safari page and then post your questions there. I'm looking forward to chatting to you on my next Wild Earth drive. Princess Tlalamba. She's not so much of a princess anymore. She's very comfortable in her jackalberry tree. They often leave it in the same tree, unless they move it around the same tree to find a better purchase, because as the animal diminishes in meat, it becomes more difficult to keep it in one spot. 
but it's a lot of effort for them to move it, so they don't move it if they don't need to. They won't rehoist it deliberately unless it falls. They won't physically take it out of one tree to take it to another tree, no. Unless it's small enough to do so. But generally they put it in a tree and that's it. Like packing your groceries the way you do it once. You might take it from the bag, put it on the counter and then put it in the cupboard, but once it's in the cupboard, it stays there. Unless it falls out again. But to, to move it around is huge amounts of energy. I don't know if any of you have tried to move an animal equivalent in your own weight around. Anyone who's got kids who know how much effort it is to, to pick up children and keep moving children all over the place. Now, take something that's equivalently your weight. The less you have to move it, the better. Move it into a position that you're happy with and then leave it there. And that was a fully grown female impala by the size of the feet, by the amount of time she spent on it. Looking at 40, 35 to 45 kilograms. It's a lot of food. 90 pounds. Last did you move 90 pounds around? Not just moving it from the floor from here to there, but physically taking it 15. How many meters is that, Darby? Six, seven meters up? Yeah. About 18 feet. 20 feet up. 20 feet up. It's an enormous amount of strength required to do that using your nails and holding it in your mouth. <laughs> Incredible. That's why um, when they found her for the whole first day, she'd left it on the floor. She spotted something. The whole first day she left it on the floor and um, she fed on it until obviously it lost a bit of its weight. We see leopards doing that. We see leopards sometimes disemboweling their prey on the floor, eating it a bit in the daytime. If it's night time, they can't afford to do that. They've got to take it up because the hyenas are going to find it quickly. But in the daytime, they've got a little bit of time. Black Widow Spala still haven't been able to check her tummy. She's not making it very easy for us. So. Right here, some voices. We are in the sighting. Another vehicle.
Well, you're going to stay right yet. Send you over to the Brydons and the Bushwalk team. Good morning and welcome back to Eco Training Pridelands. We've been scouring the southern parts of Impala Plains and covered a similar route to a few mornings ago. We're very fortunate again to be able to locate on the tracks of one of our prominent leopards in this area. This is a mother with three, sorry, with two cubs. And if we look at over here, we can see one, two little three lobes at the back and fairly long rounded toes, which is typical of a female. We also find that female leopard has a smaller track than that of a male. And we also find to tend that the male's toes tend to be much more rounded in appearance compared to that of a female. So what we'll be doing for the remainder of the morning is see if we can locate on her, seeing that these tracks are still fairly fresh. For those of you that have joined us for the first time, we are not quite sure how to age a track. We normally look at how shiny the appearance is inside the track and we also look at how sharp the outer edges of the track is. Because once this has been exposed to sun or heat or wind, these little edges start crumbling. So we can have a rough idea. But this track was made in the early parts of this morning when she and the two cubs moved through the area. The area of Impala Plains provides a lot of cover. Open areas where Impala could possibly go and um, arrest at night time, which provides them with opportunity to see potential threats coming close by, and it also provides a number of drainage lines. And leopard is an ambush predator that likes a lot of uh, concealment. So they would normally use a drainage line like the one directly behind us, and they will creep up to their prey or wait close by to their prey. Hunting with leopards is probably one of the most amazing sightings I've ever had in my life. And what we often find is that we see them stalking up to the prey, disappearing within meters away from them. And then they wait and wait until the moment is right. It's probably also one of the fastest sprints that I've seen. They reckon that leopard can make a move at approximately 90 kilometers an hour. And it's really impressive to see how they can bring down an impala. What I also find fascinating about leopard is their strength. And if you think of it, they can actually carry a prey item three times their own weight up into a tree to avoid that that meal gets taken away by a species such as hyena. We're gonna continue our walk and see if we can catch up with this leopard. Good morning, Luke, and welcome to the show. And with regards to your question why they are much larger, um, I haven't really ever given it much thought, but they do really use their whiskers when they are stopping and walking. So if it brushes against something, they know that it's time to stop. And they don't make any unnecessary noises when they are moving through brush. As we continue, we're going to meanwhile hand you over to Deirdre and Swalu. So, update uh, so far is uh, we're still on the tracks of these cheetah. It's the two males. Uh, they've uh, done some scent marking and they're two men on a mission. So we are... Uh, trying to cover the blocks and see uh, exactly which areas they've been uh, moving in there around the dam. But uh, we're seeing, we haven't heard any alarm calls from any animals, so we don't know if we're close to them at all. But normally around the dam area, there's uh, springbuck and wildebeest <coughs> uh, and some hemsbok. So we'll uh, just keep going. Have a look slowly as to see what's uh, happening. Oh, there's some, looks like some starlings on the ground there, BK. Cape Glossy Starling on the left. They must be picking up uh, 
ants and it almost looks like a looks like a drongo on the right, but he's no just a juvenile. They must be tucking into some good ants there. It's just nice to see that little iridescent sheen of the feathers. We're going to carry on on our uh, pursuit of these two males and uh, we'll send you across to Steve with his leopard. after one. They're very opportunistic like that. Not uncommon for them to, to hunt again when they've got food. Squirrels just <laughs> are starting to lose their marbles. Not really, very badly. Girl, she's been here the whole time and now you're making a noise. Sorry about the aerial. Let me just quickly reverse to open it up. See how I put no faith in squirrels because she's been here the whole time. Now they're starting to alarm call. to pick up her scraps off of the floor. You are a very well-fed young leopard, aren't you? It's going to walk between us and the other vehicle. Now we can get a chance to see a bear. Oh, she's going to have a poo right there. Marvellous. So ladylike. Generally, Ryan, generally leopards will open open the stomach and feed on the rump. Internal organs are highly valuable. Oh, she's got a bit of a paunch on there. A little bit of a paunch on there. Internal organs are very valuable. But they love the rump. But that means sometimes you find it in a parlor and all that gets eaten initially is the face. It's very hard to say, really, but you know, the best bits are the rump, the fillet. Oh, she's going to lie down right over there. The fillet or the back strap, and then uh, the internal organs, the liver, kidneys, and that sort of thing. Not the, the stomach, necessarily, although that does eventually get eaten, if not thrown to the floor gobbled up by the hyenas. Okay, so we're just going to move up. Another vehicle wants to go out the other way. They move up and get another view of her. Maybe get a view of her uh, of her belly now. Oh, that's a good, that's a good position, Darby. Sucker marks. Maybe we 
plants don't seem to stand it in any way. Obsidian, yes, they will. They're very opportunistic. They will store as many as they can. I've had a male leopard once with two baby warthogs and a baby zebra. Tree. Heard this as well with more. If it's more like that, they'll store them up the same tree. For example, those piglets and that young zebra were very easy for that male leopard to, to stash. That means he can also defend them against any other leopard that arrives, putting them in multiple different trees. Although doable, means there's not a good chance of you being able to actually feed on them later. But that opportunistic nature of a leopard hoisting in random trees is possibly what could lead to them abandoning kills as they get caught up with the hunt they end up killing more than they need hoisting them where they find them and potentially not coming back due to the fact that they spend three days on another one Stay with the Princess T and be a Sinjo over to DJ in Solid Kalahari. So, we found this little guy, a pearl spotted owlet. He made the mistake of calling uh, and he's now attracted himself some unwanted attention in that the drongo is sitting just above watching him, keeping an eye on him. And uh, he's also got a sunbird that's uh, looking to uh, chase him away. So he uh, he might be pushed off as soon as he moves. The drongo is ready to chase him. So they'll um, they'll get all the other birds uh, riled up, and then the poor little guy gets mobbed. And that's one of the reasons why they've got those false eyes on the back of their head because uh, everybody wants to attack them, and they don't want to get uh, injured. So they have these fake eyes on the back of the head so that the birds that keep attacking them don't necessarily know if it's uh, the eyes in the front or the eyes that are just spots made up of feathers on the back of the head. So he hasn't called again. But he's roughly about 10 centimetres in size. So that's why they call them owlets, because he's quite small. So they will be owls that will be active early morning and late afternoon. And they, their predominant prey source being their size is mostly insects. Uh, but they can take little birds or little fledglings, which is one of the reasons why uh, all the other birds want to mob them and chase them away from their, their nests. Thompson is asking how many different species of owls are there in Swalu? So we can go through them. We've got the pearl spotted owlet. We've got the scops owl, the African scops owl. We've got the white faced owl, the spotted eagle owl, the barn owl, as well as the verose eagle owl. So uh, that's uh, six species. 
And this is the smallest one of them. And the next one up would be the African Scopsal, which is not that much bigger. So we said he's about 10 centimeters and then the largest owl, the rose eagle owl, is roughly about 80 centimeters. So you can just sort of get a scale of the size difference. So while he sits there, he hasn't made another sound, we're going to send you across to JP at Pridelands. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We're still on the trail of our leopard and she's continued walking quite a big distance. But in the meanwhile, we found something that's very unique and an animal that I have not seen on Pridelands. And this is a track of a hippopotamus. And if you look over here, it's a fairly large track that extends from this point to this point. This track is also quite often confused with that of rhino. However, if you do look at the hippo, they've got one, two, three, four toes, unlike rhino, which has three toes. There's also a few other telltale signs which is telling us a little bit of a story. Fresh dung that has been dropped right over here, and then more dung that has been scattered against this tree. And this is most likely be done by a male hippopotamus. Quite often what they will do is use that fat little stubby tail of theirs to flick for dung. There's a number of reasons why they do it. One is to demarcate a territory against water, and then also for navigational purposes. And sometimes they also dung shower one another as a dominant signal. Now, if we have a closer look over here, we can see the grass on which it's been feeding. There's also an interesting African tale that relates to this. And the story goes as such, that once upon a time, hippos used to eat fish. But being the glutton that they are, they ate all the fish in the river. And the crocodile eventually went to go and consult their maker and said, listen, the hippo is eating everything and there's absolutely nothing for me. Eventually, the maker decided to punish the hippo and told him to go and eat grass. And to prove that he was being faithful to his promise and eating only grass, he had to shower his dung so that the maker could see that there was no fish bones inside the dung itself. So hopefully we'll be able to find our hippopotamus one of these days, as he's been eluding us all the time. From here, we're going to continue and see if we can catch up with our leopard. Nestled on the banks of one of the largest lakes in the Sabi Sands lies an award-winning game lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. Many of you will have been on safari here virtually with Wild Earth, but now we are offering you the chance to see it for yourself in person. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the end of April and you and a friend could win three nights to this luxury lodge. In addition to the unforgettable safaris, you can unwind on the deck, relax in the pool, and even savor the various bush dining experiences. Chitwa's holistic approach to hospitality, with specific emphasis on conservation, will leave you with the very best memories of the African wild. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. For many years, Wild Earth has taken viewers from around the world to the Mara Triangle, a place of majestic beauty and abundant wildlife. But it wasn't always like this. Before 2001, it was infested with poachers. Illegal harvesting and hunting was rife. Now the situation couldn't be more different. The hard work and dedication of the Mara Conservancy has revolutionized this magical land. But now, the loss of revenue from tourism has created a grave crisis. 
the Mara Conservancy needs help if they are to continue protecting the reserve and supporting the local communities whose livelihood depend on its survival. My name is Ross and I'm a field guard at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. So welcome back buddy, and as you can see we are still slowly bumbling about. Didn't manage to find tracks of the pride in the south, but when we came onto this section of the, the reserve where it's a, there's some nice big clearings, we found a good amount of tracks that look like they're from early last night at some stage. Most of them were heading north, and there were some that came back south, so I don't know if they were maybe hunting in this area last night. And then it looks like some of them have cut west into this area on our left hand side. So I think that's what we're going to do for the rest of the day. Tracks going up and down here, but most of them are coming north. So we'll just keep slowly checking north, cut left on one of the roads that takes us in a westerly direction and see if we can't find tracks where they cross. Or maybe if we're lucky, we'll find them lying in the road or in a clearing. Um, it is starting to heat up quite quickly this morning. It's nearly time to take jerseys off. So there's a good chance that these lions would have stopped moving by now and look for some place to rest up for the day. So we've got to keep our eyes peeled and keep searching for these lions. I mean, we all know with those two white ones, those are the ones that we tend to pick up on first. But we're going to send you back to Steve at Juma while we continue searching for these lions. Mm, very hot indeed. We've just taken off our jackets. Columbus moved to a bit of shade, about 100 meters from the kill. Thought she was going to go off to drink, but she stopped. A lot of energy. Oh, here we go. Look at that belly. She might continue on, on up towards Tambeta Pan. Oh, she's just going to find a nice shady spot there. And we get to go around. Okay, well, while we get out of this little area, we're going to send you back over to Tzvada Kalari. So we come over the dune and we've just found a very, very nice herd of eland. Um, but they were running. And then uh, the reason they're running is there's uh, two ostrich that came running over the dune and uh, bumped into them and gave them a complete fright. So they've settled down now. Uh, but the two ostrich came running over the dune straight into the herd of uh, eland and caused absolute chaos. That's a nice uh, male and female ostrich pair. And the eland have now... They ran their short distance and uh, they've settled down. They're just walking, but look at that scenery. Beautiful, beautiful views from up here on the top of the dune. So therein lies the challenge. We're looking for the cheetah somewhere in there. So 
these ends are just moving off. Started to run again. So that's typical to be in a herd. Sometimes in summer seasons when you've got really, really good grazing, which we do have at the moment, the herds get quite large. They can get to well over 600 if they want to in a herd. That was probably about 20 or 30 in that group. Um, at um, between 10 and 11 o'clock. <laughs> But they are disappearing there into a thicket. There we go. Everyone is uh, saying gorgeous. It is a beautiful morning. It's going to be an incredibly hot day today. There is not a cloud in the sky. So uh, we are in for a scorcher, probably well over 30 degrees again today. And I think it's our last sort of burst of uh, heat is this last week and then we'll definitely start heading into much colder mornings. So as they disappear there into the thickets, we're going to send you uh, across to Steve. It sounds like he's managed to uh, reposition. Oh, slender mongoose meets Tlalamba. Are you ready for it? Goodness, the opportunistic nature of these cats is incredible. She's going to go for it as she can. Oh, my goodness. She's on luck with the Nyari that's here at uh, Weyatala entrance. Uh, it's slowly moving. Sorry about that. Game job radio's got a mind of its own. That's slender mongoose. I don't know what it would taste like, but it just goes to show you the depths and the extent or range with which these leopards will feed. Where are you taking us, Columba? Where are you taking us? We don't know. We shall follow. She's walking straight down Twin Dams Road now. Stalking again. Everything that pops out in front of her. There's always a few mongoose on this road. Better pan was to the right up the hill. Maybe she knows of closer water. Maybe she wants to go to Chilapan. Although I feel like Gari Dam or Buitera Dam would have been closer. Maybe there's something else she's on her way to do. Didn't see suckle marks, everybody. We had a good look. Suckle marks would be quite obvious around the uh, the belly area. Be quite swollen mammary glands with uh, sort of matted fur around them, which would indicate that she's suckled cubs, which happens very soon after birth.
Squirrels are being great today. Morgan, well, the, the reserve is as large as it is, and if anything, the reserve gets bigger as more properties join in over time, Pridelands being an example of that. And uh, there will be a saturation point where the cats will reach an equilibrium and um, the balance will form. Essentially, it's not about the reserve getting smaller. There's only so much habitat in these reserves for X number of animals. And once they've reached that saturation point, they'll have to disperse. And that's when we start seeing conflicts outside of reserves. But uh, generally the lifespan of many of these animals and the dispersal strategies have been a quite good alignment. There's lots of space in the Kruger and there's always uh, individuals dying off. support from Tundi. If anything, Tundi will fight her for the territory she's trying to claim. I mean, there's, obviously there'll be memory. They, they know each other. But uh, these cats are highly competitive, everybody. Highly competitive. There's no, no support. No support with cubs, no support with feeding. She's been given her feeding opportunities as a cub. And that's it. It's done now. Just looked at an impala. It looked like an impala. It's probably what she looks at. A dry bush. Okay, so there are some pans just here on Ingwe Alley. If she turns, that might be the closest pathway. You, you kind of assume that she's heading for water, everybody. That's kind of the assumption. Obviously, without being able to read her mind. Keep following. Junction with Ingwe Alley is coming up. She's not scent marking, she's not spraying, she she had another poo before he got onto the road, but they don't use that as a form of scent marking. Whenever I've seen Tundi with new cubs or eminent with cubs, she gets very vigorous in her scent marking. Everywhere she walked 15, 20 meters, she would scent mark. I doubt the pheromones given off in that scent mark would indicate a lot about the status of that female. Pregnant or with cubs, whatever it might be, there would be communication set out. Wonder boy, yes, the boys have to leave. Uh, the girls stay in large predators. It's large cats anyway. It's the girls who stay and the boys who leave. In large birds of prey, it's the opposite. It's the boys who stay and the girls who leave. It's just the way it works. The, the males, it's important for them to leave so that they can spread their genetics. She just rolled in this hippo, in this hippo mess on the side here. So if the boys stayed and the girls stayed, first of all, they would compete with each other for the same space and they'd also mate with each other. So by the boys leaving, the genetics of the boys are leaving not to mate with mum, not to mate with the sister, to go somewhere until they're eventually strong enough to mate, bringing the genetic code of this area to that area. A female's 
carving out a small section of mum's territory. Um, mum can do that. She can afford to do that over a few years um, until eventually she hands the territory over completely. And obviously, they don't only have girl cubs. I mean, Tony's got a boy now, Tlalamba before, and before Tlalamba was... Uh, was uh, Tamba, which was a boy, and before Tamba was Kuchava. Kuchava seems to have the more eastern side. Now Tlalam is taking the more western side, and Tani's in the middle. And it's kind of getting to that stage when um, she's probably unlikely to have more cubs going forward. So the territorial behavior of it all is Tlalam is going to inherit what Tani leaves behind. Might not even be a slice, it might be a large portion. But it's not given to them. They have to earn it. Other females will push in. Shadulu's been pushing in from the west for some time. Tlalamba and Shadulu have had a number of altercations before. Shadulu's a much bigger leopard. She's got a few years on Tlalamba. And um, there were some tracks, actually, of a female coming up Philemon's dip, which is basically running parallel with where we are now. And uh, back in October, we had Shadulu and Tlalamba having altercations. Walking this way, Tlalamba was walking that way, Shadulu that way, calling, scent marking, keeping a bit of a barrier between themselves. We know Shadulu's been mating, so she's probably now deciding where in my... She got a, after the mating, she's now vigorously got to demarcate her territory once more. And uh, that's possible. Well, Tlalamba's not doing anything territorial now. So, there's something else on the cards, but we don't know what. For it to be, maybe she's just going for a brisk walk to walk off her meal. She heard me talking about her tummy and she thought, let me go get some steps in. Not a single scent mark, not even a face rub, just a roll in some hippo dung. And it's warm. So there's something on the mind. Nina, it's too mask a smell. They smell very bad, covered in meat and flesh and rotting dead animal. They smell like a cat. They smell like a predator. And the dung often masks it. It's almost like why a perfume was invented. They use buffalo and hippo dung, elephant dung as well, as a perfume to overwhelm or to mask the scent that they have. Yeah, she found another bit of dung there. There's some buffalo dung that's a few days old. She thought to maybe enjoy, but a few two days past its, its eau de boeuf fragrance for her. It probably helps them to mask that smell, so it probably makes hunting more successful. But um, they also seem to enjoy it. They actually like to do it. They like to roll in it. If you've got cats at home, you'll probably notice that they like to roll in certain plants. They like to cover themselves in certain aromas. Some dogs do it as well. Just love to roll in the scents of other things. You know, is there more to it than that? I'm not sure. Um, definitely they eat and they ingest the, the dung of many herbivore animals, which no doubt adds a fair bit to the digestive system microorganisms as well as gut digestive enzymes which are being a, a meat eater they don't have many of those enzymes in the gut so they can get minerals they can get nutrients and they can get microorganisms from the animal manure that they roll in and often we find them physically eating fresh buffalo dung She knows this area well, just to the left-hand side, probably about 80 meters or so, is where she was born. Oh, Rochelle, those pads are perfect. She's seen something. No, she's being very alert, though. I wonder what she's spotting. Rochelle, the pads are perfect. They are such beautiful little feet. Leopard tracks and leopard feet are just... <laughs> I quite enjoy them. They leave such a nice, perfect track for us to follow. 
And you can see again, everybody, example of why we spend so much time tracking on the road. Her general sort of direction. You know, like if we found these tracks over there and we didn't have the animal, we'll follow this sort of route. See how she, she might cut across from one side of the road to the other, keeping to sometimes the softest patch, sometimes the easiest patch. So we're always looking for those tracks, but knowing where the water is, like I know for a fact the closest water to her now is Chelapan. There might be some just in this little drainage where we are, but I think it might have dried up already. It's a very sandy sort of river stream. Chelapan is a, a very nice mud-based pan, a pangolin track, which is to the right of this one's also got a lot of little puddles. But uh, Chelapan's probably the most substantial one that she's making her way towards. So through that mindset, you can you can speed up the process. Oh, she, look how she's struggling up the hill. <laughs> Change gears, my darling. <laughs> oh, she's salivating. It's a lot of effort for a leopard to be walking in these temperatures, everybody. It costs them a lot of energy, covered in fur as they are. To be walking like this takes a lot of um, energy, and it's why when they do rest, they rest properly. But uh, she will need to, to have something to drink, so I'm almost certain that is the objective of this little foray. And then she'll probably stay close to a shady spot by the water. She won't go if there wasn't much meat left on that carcass, to be honest, but she wouldn't go back to it now. She might go back to it this afternoon when it's a, when it's a cool down again. I think Lauren waited with that kill for some time and then she just materialized again. Go off for a drink, go into the watering hole. They've got to wait for the temperature to be suitable before coming back. Otherwise, it's just all that added sort of energy cost. Okay, so in about 40 meters or so, she should turn left towards Chelapan, if I'm not mistaken, if that is her intention. But uh, she might have an, a whole other idea in mind. Okay, well, we're going to stay with her, see where she gets to. In the meantime, send you back over to Deirdre. So we're uh, still on the search, but uh, as we're going into these areas, the grass is just getting thicker and thicker, much higher. So. We uh, hope we'll be able to see them, but there's some little uh, crowned lapwings running here in the open clearing. Got him. There we go. So they do like to prefer these open areas. There was three of them, so a little family group. Uh, and for them, these open clearings are essential. It's easy for them to see if there's any predators around. Uh, they can find uh, insects and be aware of uh, what's going on around them. They don't, we never find the lapwings, this particular species, in areas where the grass cover is too high. Uh, you'll only ever find them in these very, very short grassy areas. This is almost a creeper that's been around in this area. And they're known to be very, very aggressive about, uh, if they're sitting on a nest, they'll, they'll have a nest in an open area like this. It's just a shallow scraping in the ground. Uh, and the eggs will be uh, sort of a dotted, mottled coloration just to blend into the soil. And if any predator, or even animals, even if it's a chemspok or a wildebeest comes too close to their nest, then the female will uh, stand up. She'll open her wings so she appears uh, bigger. Uh, and they start shouting at the potential threat to make them move off and leave uh, leave them and their eggs alone. Let's 
we can keep on uh, bumbling in through these open uh, clearings. We might uh, be fortunate. These are also the places where the ground squirrels like to live is in these openings. Otherwise, uh, they also uh, can't see predators. Jerome is asking the question, do those birds ever pretend to have a broken wing? You are 100% correct. The lapwings are known for that. Oh, there they go. Um, in that if they feel that there's a threat to either the eggs or the chicks, um, they will uh, flap their wing to the one side and sort of stumble as if uh, they're injured. So maybe a jackal or a predator would be attracted to the adult and then just as it gets there, uh, it'll fly off normally. So it is known that they do that. It's known as a distraction display. Uh, and uh, the lapwings are famous for doing it, both the crown lapwing as well as the blacksmith lapwing. It's quite a clever little uh, little thought. Can you imagine what uh, it went through to think that that was a good idea? Ooh. We'll have to try and see if we can find the road. I can hardly even see the road. It goes here somewhere, but... Uh, we'll head through the sour grass and see uh, if we have any luck. So we, um, Sarah Beck is asking the question, what is the difference between an ostrich and an emu? So an ostrich is much bigger in size. Uh, only has two toes um, and is found in Africa. Uh, the emu is from Australia. It's much shorter, probably just over a meter, 1.2 at most. Uh, and uh, it has three toes. And interestingly enough, they actually both, uh, the ostrich egg is about this size and sort of a creamy white color. Uh, and the emu's egg is black, which is uh, unusual and it's probably about that size. But otherwise, uh, both of them are flightless. So, yeah, be predominantly just walking on the ground. They'd probably eat roughly the same thing, would be insects and bugs uh, and anything uh, moving on the ground. But distributionally, we don't get the emu here. BK, you're gonna have to help me find the road. There it goes. This one hasn't been driven in a while. Even the creepers have gone over the road. The road less traveled is where we're on at the moment. So we're still uh, gonna see if we can get a view over into the next June Street as we go. We're gonna send you to JP. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. We're still in pursuit of our leopard track and as that we continued, we found a large number of hyena tracks and activity. The track just led us off the road and where we looked at it, we found the scat or the feces um, of a spotted hyena. What you'll notice is that it's white in color, which will suggest that it had a large amount of calcium intake. As hyenas has got incredibly strong jaws, they can also break down bone and feed on this. Quite often when they do have a large amount of meat in their digestive tract, then the dung will differ in color and it will often be more black in color due to the high amount of blood. What I do find interesting is that one of the species of tortoise that we have in this area, which is known as the Spex hinge tortoise, will often seek out the feces of hyenas and then feed on this to obtain the necessary calcium for the development of its eggshells, which would obviously be absent in its diet from normal plants. So 
So quite often what we also find quite close by to hyena feces, especially where it's on large amounts where it's been deposited, which will indicate that it might be a territorial boundary, is little smear marks where they will smear the anal gland onto a grass stalk to also leave an important message in terms of creating a little social media page, which will share information about its well-being, its rank and social status, as well as reproductive status and a number of other facts that they can determine by smelling on this secretion. We're going to continue and walk off and see what we can go and find. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. Graham, I'm just going to see there's a very good place that I want to see if we can get good signal from there. That's what I'd like to know. Welcome to dawn in the African bush. How cool is this? Can you believe it? Tubs are now only 10 feet from us. Unbelievable. Elephants chasing wild dogs, wild dogs chasing elephants. Pandemonium! Watching how Wild Earth has grown since 2007 has been truly remarkable. On the 27th of April this year, Wild Earth will be turning 14, and we would love to hear from you. Please send us your own special birthday message, which we can share with the rest of the Wild Earth family. Maybe you can tell us why you started watching Wild Earth, what Wild Earth means to you, or you could just send us a very happy birthday. Don't forget when you want to film yourself to hold your phone sideways to get the best angle. When you are ready, you can email your videos through to birthday at wildearth.tv. I love being a cam up for Wild Earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. Well, welcome back everybody. Fortunately, she's just had a quick little drink in a very dirty little pan here between Chella Pan and Spaghetti Junction. Almost like it was an afterthought. She was like, oh, is there water there? Let me quickly have a little look. Hello, beautiful lady. Where are you taking us? She's heading directly south on the bar, on the Twin Dams Road now. shall follow. See where she takes us to. She's now drunk and she's continuing on the other way. So, what does that mean? What does that tell us? She's trying to get her steps in, waiting for her little watch <laughs> app to vibrate to tell her she's got the 10,000 steps in for the day. I'm only joking around, she doesn't have one of those yet. Still looking for sponsorship. <laughs> there she goes. Isn't that beautiful? So now, looking at her belly earlier, 
It definitely looks like there's something going on with the belly, but it was very hard to tell. We didn't see any distended or swollen mammary glands, and we didn't see the characteristic sort of uh, matted fur around the mammary glands. But it's possible that after a few days uh, of her being in the tree, on her belly, rubbing the belly up and down, I suppose, on the tree itself, that uh, if there was matted fur around mammary glands, it could have dried off and it could have been combed back into place. Because uh, where she's going now, we don't know. But uh, it's very exciting. I'm, I'm rather excited. Davi, you excited? D Davi actually said if she does take us to Cubs, he's going to cry. Yep. I think I might too. Okay, well, we're going to follow Tlalamba and send you over to Lauren. Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Actually, it's morning, but it feels like afternoon. We are here. We're sitting at Bufosuk Dam with the most beautiful herd of elephants. And I, of course, hope that they're going to go to the water to drink. My name is Lauren. I do have Morgan on camera. And we've had lots of car troubles this morning, I'm afraid. Lots and lots. But we are here. We are surviving. We were with Inseli on a kill. She's got a kill at Sussan's Dam in Bufosuk. But sadly, we couldn't go live, and now we found this most wonderful herd of elephants. They are completely relaxed. There's a lot of youngsters. Of course, adults, I think it's a very large breeding herd. So I don't think they're on their way to swim, but they're very, very close to the dam. I'm obviously hoping that they go for a drink. Elephants are one of my favorites, and water. It's one of my favorite things. So together, it's really just magical. And I wonder if they've maybe already been for water. <laughs> and we go through periods here where we don't see elephants at all. And you miss them. You miss their presence. <laughs> you feel their presence when you're next to them, even the smaller ones. I'm pulling up the grass. The young boys at the back there are just fighting and tussling and wrestling. This is day number three with Kalamba, though. Isn't that wonderful? She's been missing in action for so long, and this is the third day in a row. here they're both having a little bit of a tussle morgan deciding who's going to get the most delicious grass now even when you're not sure of the elephant dynamics or you've just arrived on the scene you can really feel the presence of their social dynamics within the herd it is so tight-knit it is so cohesive and of course that's their key to survival, life in a herd. Even the boys, when they're young, of course that changes as they get older. But life in a herd is everything to an elephant. Life is herd, herd is life. The females wouldn't survive being solitary. And you can feel that, you can feel that when you're in the presence of an elephant herd. constantly communicating. We just don't know that. They're communicating in ways that we can't even begin to fathom. Yes, we understand the mechanics of it. We understand they detect vibrations. We understand how they detect vibrations. We understand they're producing sounds that are so low in frequency that we can't hear them. It's still very difficult for us to fathom that. The matriarch is always leading. They are always communicating. It's just humans are completely oblivious to it. And sometimes when humans can't feel it or see it or hear it, we tend to think it doesn't exist. And of course it does exist.
I mean, like all highly social mammals, elephants have a really well-developed system of communication that makes use, well, makes use, sorry, of all their senses, from the hearing, the smell, the vision, the touch. It's extremely well-developed, including that ability to detect vibrations. I mean, acoustically, a typical human male voice, so not like mine, but like Morgan's, for example, it normally fluctuates in around 110 hertz. Females is obviously higher than that. But among elephants, a typical male rumble can fluctuate on average at a minimum of 12 hertz. So that's 110 hertz for human male. On average, I'm well aware that differs across the human population. And a male elephant, 12 hertz. And that's why we can't detect these very, very low frequencies. They could all be having a really nice conversation right now. Probably talking about us. Probably talking about Wendy. And the reason they can detect vibrations is from these specialized cells, mechanical receptors. And these mechanical receptors are the ones that are detecting specialized cells that are detecting the vibrations and processing it. Monica, they don't always have holes in their ears. Um, if you put your hand to your ear right now and run, in, run it along the edges, you will feel that most of the human ear is cartilage. And you've just got this sort of flap at the bottom where we get our ears pierced, if you like, although you can get anything pierced these days, you know what I mean, which is just skin. But most of our ear is cartilage. If you look at an elephant's ear, you can actually see it quite well from this angle. The very, very top part, the curvature, that's cartilage, which is not the same as bone. It's very flexible and it's very soft, it's not as dense as bone. That's what's giving the elephant's ear the shape. But from that part of cartilage at the very top, all the way down the rest of the ear, it's just skin. There's no bone, there's no cartilage, there's no material there other than skin and of course a blood supply. And therefore it's very thin. It's actually thinner than the little fatty pad at the bottom of our ears that we pierce. So over an elephant's lifetime, they run through the thicket, they fight with one another, they throw around branches. So naturally, due to wear and tear, it starts to get a bit tatty and look a little bit older and sometimes have holes in it. And it's just because it's incredibly thin skin and it's thin for a reason. It's thin to for thermoregulation, to release heat, to sort of accelerate that heat loss because they live in such a hot environment. So I'm gonna try and stay with these elephants a little bit longer and we are gonna send you across to Steve with Tlalamba. Welcome back everybody, we're still with her. This is an area she spent a lot of time as a youngster. We're on Mamba Loop at the moment. Had a lot of time with her just here. She keeps looking back at me, giving us that Moati. Are oh, you still following me? Look. This is not one I've used to Tlalamba doing. But she's very purposeful in her movements.
So the two times we found uh, Tony's previous litter, one was back there, one was just further down there. The drainage just this side is where Tlalamba was actually, was actually born. Well, she was born one drainage up, and then she spent a lot of time in the drainage just here, Batalia and Mamba. So she's very familiar with these areas. When she was in her first few months, she was close to, spent a lot of time close to uh, Fulamon's dip in the center of Juma, and then Tony moved her to this area towards Mamba, Mamba Loop area, where she spent, their mother took them to, or moved them between. Because obviously a leopard spending its youth in and around a small area like that, they get to learn it quite well, all the little nooks and crannies. And um, obviously if they've survived, it was a successful place. But look how sneaky she's being. She's walking in the middle of the road there. She's leaving no trail for us to follow if we were tracking her. It's almost as if she's tiptoeing right now, everybody. Tiptoeing, I don't know about you, but the anticipation is building in my belly building she's probably going to go to the termite mound on the right there with probably the most gorgeous tamboti tree we have on the property sky doogie just hold on a moment longer don't die don't die i know the suspense is is killing many of us um we're driving in first gear low range very slowly um, as soon as she stops or she's listening, whatever, we switch off. She's obviously opportunistic in that nature that she's also hunting as she goes. That magnificent jackal uh, tamburti tree up ahead. She might be headed towards that. But uh, there's some very nice little drainage system coming up. Very nice little what they locally call the Ashukova, where, you know, you find leopards then in the, the drainage system, in the dry riverbeds where there's ample cover, there's little holes where the roots have held the soil together and some uh, waters eroded away, little cavities and bushes and thickets. They don't use conventional den sites like hyenas would in the, and wild dogs in the form of termite mounds they use scrub and cover yeah I think we touched on this this morning about kills they will hoist the kill wherever they get it. If it's small enough to move, they'll put it in the same tree as what they have already. But if it's opportunistic and they kill lots just due to conditions, they'll hoist where they can and they'll probably leave one here, one there. You don't often find it, but after crazy wind conditions and weather systems, often you can find leopards having killed more than one. I believe uh, before I started here, there was a situation where there was a number of kills on quarantine trees all over the place david do you remember that yeah. and uh, basically it was just the leopard being able to catch in a killing frenzy and um, that's possibly one of the reasons why they might abandon kills because either they've forgotten about it or it's like in the mara when there's so many wildebeest to catch they just kill them drop them on the floor kill kill that's what predators do they they will keep that's why a predator that gets into a hen house or an area where where livestock, what, whatever, can't get away, they'll just kill. Because the animal keeps running past them. And they, they don't always kill for hunger. They often kill because the animal is running. That is just what they do. It's that instinct. So yes, it is possible to have multiple kills in different trees. But I doubt that's what she's doing. I doubt she's moving all this way to go to another kill that she stashed. And if she did, she would do so when the conditions were more suitable. It is warm now, everybody. It's warm, and I'm hot, and I'm not covered in fur like she is. I'll show you, once we eventually do stop, how far she has walked. And it definitely, it's normally these distances are, are covered at a time when the conditions are much cooler. As it's all about energy in the animal world, 
all about energy conservation. Animals don't give it away unnecessarily. Okay, well, I'm going to follow her further and send you back to Lauren, who I think is still with her elephants. They did come down to drink. Listen, let's just listen for a moment. up for having a tough morning, hasn't it, Morgan? because of their digestive system it is so incomplete that the fibrous dung that the sort of intestines produce would not be able to pass if there wasn't water i know it doesn't sound very pleasant but that's why their dung is very watery if it wasn't it would get stuck so they need a lot of water especially for their body size and the heat and most of all their incomplete digestive system
Okay, we're going to sit here as long as we can in this magical moment. And for now, we're going to send you across to JP. Good morning and welcome back to Pridelands. As we continued our walk, we found this big mass of tree that was pushed over and a large amount of grasses on the side. So this doesn't really make sense until you start looking at the interpretation of this. The elephants will deliberately push over trees to get to the roots. And in this way, they also create a balance between grasses and trees within the area. So they tend to feed more often on grasses during the summer month. We will feed more often on a number of other plant matter during the winter months. So what happened here is at some stage, this tree was pushed back over again to expose the fresh green grasses. Where elephant, you'll see mothers doing that for this, where they push over a tree that's back position so that the calf can have access to the fresh grass. This also creates little homes quite often and protective areas for small little species like scrub hair and rodents that will hide underneath these bushes. We're going to continue our walk and from there and see what we can go and find. Nestled on the banks of one of the largest lakes in the Sabi Sands lies an award-winning game lodge called Chitwa Chitwa. Many of you would have been on safari here virtually with Wild Earth, but now we are offering you the chance to see it for yourself in person. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer before the end of April and you and a friend could win three nights to this luxury lodge. In addition to the unforgettable safaris, you can unwind on the deck, relax in the pool and even savour the various bush dining experiences. Chitwa's holistic approach to hospitality with specific emphasis on conservation will leave you with the very best memories of the African wild. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. So in 1998, we had this idea to go and put a live web camera on a waterhole somewhere in the Sabi Sands next to the Kruger National Park. And I approached just about every single landowner and everybody thought I was completely crazy until I met Yuri and Pippa Moorman. We thought it was definitely a fun idea and a worthwhile thing to experiment. And it immediately became a runaway success. And it gave people all around the world the opportunity to watch a little piece of Africa day and night. Back in 1998, it was the very early stages of the internet. And all we were able to do was to get a 30 second refreshing JPEG out of that camera. But over time, what we began to do is focus more and more on trying to develop this concept of giving people the opportunity to go on safari. Even though we live just 500 meters up this hill, we still put the camera on to see what's happening. Absolutely, we watch it <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> My name is Taylor McCurdy and I work for Eco Training. I love hearing from all of the viewers. However, I particularly enjoy those of you who have been watching for a few years. Your questions are just so advanced and they really get me thinking. If you'd like to ask a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once you've done that, head to the live safari page and submit your questions below the live. Some are drinking, some are playing. And the youngsters are annoying each other as they love to do. Oh, brothers and sisters love to annoy one another. I still love to annoy my brother to this day.
Or the lapwings don't like it when other animals come to their water body, do they? The vegetation, the vegetation is still so green, thick and lush. There's still such a diversity of food options for the elephants right now. So they're thriving. And it is winter. It's the start of winter, but it's, it's winter. I have no words right now. I have no words. <sighs> we are um, truly blessed at this very moment to see what is already a few week old cub. It's already lost the very dark patches. Can you believe it? Mama Tlalamba? Well, Everybody, the anticipation has paid off. She has guided us exactly to what everybody's been hoping for. And uh, goodness, she's been around with this cub already for some time and we didn't even know about it. So if you so desire, send through a one-word tweet letting us know how does this make you feel. I feel truly, truly blessed to to be in this situation. Good girl, Mama. Good girl. I saw her for the first time. She was a little bit older than that cub. Just a little bit. Perfect little drainage line here in the bank. Nina, you say you're in awe. Well, we are. <laughs> we're in awe as well. Um, see the beautiful Tamburti thickets around her there. This little bank where the river's cut into the side above her head there. Perfect little nooks and crannies. I mean, like, you know where she is, but you can't see her. That little cub is very happy to see her. Such a proud mama. <coughs> Nancy is ecstatic. Oh, very good word. She went into this drainage and we had to come around. Uh, we saw her, stopped in the sand for a moment and then she moved off and we thought we'd lost her. And then all time favorite sounds for me when I'm on the vehicle, when you hear someone like Davi go, I've got it. I have no idea where he's looking, but I just know that bodes well. And you hadn't seen the cub, had you? That's so he just saw her. I picked up the binoculars. Yeah, I hadn't, didn't actually pick up binoculars. I think I just saw her with the naked arm. My binos are hidden away. <sighs> Look at it. Is there more than one? Look at it, everybody. Oh, my goodness. Oh, hey, little Nene. Well, 
that's about as good as it gets, everybody. Joyous, Heather. You are joyous. Well, bless you, Heather. That is as good as it gets, everybody, and uh, there's no other. We can't move forward. I can't really change the position. She's now moved, hiding in the long grass, but we'll take it. We will take it. Such a little thing. How long have you been hiding that from us? It appears there's only one. If there were more than one, they would be fighting over the milk by now. They get very thirsty. Laura, you're speechless. Thankfully, you're able to type, though, otherwise we wouldn't have heard from you. <laughs> yes, well, everybody, it is that day. I've been telling everybody that I wanted to see her before we depart on the 15th, 16th. We're going to put effort to find her. Well done to Fanuti Fanuti from Juma for finding her initially. And now we're just lucky. We're lucky that she's led us here. We wouldn't have found her anyway. You saw how she got here, everybody. She walked along the grass track. Okay, the cup is up. She walked along the grass track. How would we have found her? No ways. I check this road all the time because I know it's a road she loves. No, it's a road she loves, but uh, if you're not walking on the sand, I mean, not even Herbie could track her if she's walking on the grass like that, being very, 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 very cautious. Lucy, you want to know a question I don't have the answer to? Uh, it's probably Moati. But I don't know, I can't tell you for sure. It's just the area he frequents, an area that, um, that she's hanging out in. This all used to fall under the, the reign of Tingana, but he hasn't been moving in this area for a while now. I can probably go forward half an inch here. Uh, should we try? Half an inch. You see, the cub has never heard a car before. And that's the habituation process. The cub heard the car, disappeared into the thickets. It'll look back at mum and be like, okay, mum didn't react. That's their natural safety mechanism with cubs is to to flee something that uncertain of. And uh, we talk about habituation, we talk about how do you habituate an animal. And Kalamba, as you all know, is very habituated from a young age. Doesn't mean she's tame, everybody. But her cub will have responded to the noise there, run into its hidey hole, which is exactly what it's supposed to do when something foreign happens or something noisy happens nearby, anything happens. That's how they keep alive. And then look back at mum and be like, okay, Mum hasn't responded, and then it'll come out and a couple steps at a time. We are the first car that's seen. And as far as we know, we are the first people to be seeing this cub. No one else has reported it. Everyone has been speculating on Tlalamba and whether she's pregnant, whether she's got cubs, and very secretive little young lady. This morning we were looking right at her belly, and I couldn't tell. I couldn't tell. She did a very good job of hiding it.
everybody. Just enjoy. We're enjoying. Don't worry. Nothing really to, to ask, nothing really to say. It's gone full circle for me now in my time here at Juma. Having Clalamba from a two month old cub when I first started to now having her with a few week old cub, probably probably two to three weeks there. I'm no expert when it comes to aging leopard cubs. His eyes are open, which means it's definitely older than 10 days. Its ears are pronounced on the top of its head, make it look like a little leopard. When they're very small, the ears are almost sort of still plastered to the head. They don't really stand out. They're just mewling little things moving around. That one was able to actually run back in. Hopefully we'll get another view. Got to spend days with Tlalumba as a youngster. Tandy denning with her in a very similar area but closer to camp. Three, four minutes from camp we could be with a leopard. We were like that almost every drive for the first two years. Darby, have you shed some tears? I have quietly. You said shed some quiet tears, everybody. glands weren't visible to us this morning her behavior was definitely indicating something of a personal interest and what could be more personal than a tiny little ball of fur perfect little drainage line we were talking about on our way through here that she spent a lot of time okay well it sounds like Ngala has got some cubs of their own I wonder if it's a lion or leopard So yes, Steve is correct, and as you can see, we have managed to find two lioness and the three cubs that we had last night. Not the lions that we had the tracks of this morning. We did try track quite hard, but just can't leave the vehicle for too long. So we've left their tracks somewhere in the central western part of Angola. We do think that they are on the property, that, that section of the Pride. It's nine members of them, we think. And we've come over into the Timbavati River where one of the other guides found these lions a little bit earlier this morning. And as you can see, the two lionesses are flat and the three little cubs are trying to suckle. I just think to listen to the noises of them while they're trying to suckle and see how patient mum is with them. She will let them suckle for, for extended periods of time, but then if it does start to hurt or just like that where she gets a little bit irritated then she moves oh look what she's doing there straight into the cubs's face it's now almost weighing on that cub's head and lions will do that just like domestic cats to cover their scent as well as the fact that they dig in the riverbed i mean have a look where she's lying in the shade you can imagine just below the, the surface of the, of the sand, it's a little bit cooler, so that's what they'll do. But I think that moment there, she was just trying to cover her scent as much as possible because they have been spending lots and lots of time in this section of the riverbed with her cubs, and when she does go out hunting at night, she will leave them as well for, for periods of time. Oh, immediately back in. Another 
the lioness. This is one of the sub-adult lionesses. Also having a big stretch and also probably just right, trying to reposition herself a little bit closer to the bank. Oh, growl from the big lioness. But their stomachs look quite full as well, so it looks like they might have eaten at some stage last night. So always so nice to see them in the Timbavati riverbed like this with no grass blocking our view. Beautiful clear images of them. And also quite lucky to have them suckling this late in the morning. It really has started to heat up. So it's quite warm in the sun. That's why these lions have moved into the shade and that's why those cubs might be suckling because it's quite a bit cooler in the shade and there's a little bit of a breeze blowing as well. Quite a nice find at the end of drive after a long, hard search, or at least coming to have a look at them. Area where those lines have headed into or the tracks from this morning is an area that doesn't tend to to provide us with the very best signal. But we're just trying to see if we could find them. It would have been very, very nice to have seen them and, and seen how they're looking because we haven't seen them for the last few days always nice catching up with this lioness and her three youngsters. We think this one lying to the right hand side of the mom, the, the bigger lioness, that might be one of this lioness's cubs from a previous litter. Her and her sister have been spending a lot of time with this section of the pride that's been moving around these central part slots. It is a cubby day, Sandra, and I'm super, super excited for Steve and the Juma team for finding that leopard cub this morning. And it sounds like he did it pretty much what we were speaking about yesterday, trying to find the female leopard and then follow her to take her back, take you back to the den. <clears throat> and I'm very, very jealous of you all that Juma as well, because it's, leopard cubs are probably one of my favorite baby animals to see as they start off with not being so well habituated, they're quite unrelaxed with the vehicles and then as you view them more and more they become more trusting and more understanding of our vehicles and what we're doing around them. We're not trying to interfere with them, we're just trying to observe them. <coughs> and it's quite a fun process trying to habituate them as well because it's quite challenging. You've got to spend lots of time with them, move the vehicle very slowly around them, not to put too much pressure on them. And that's what we managed to do with these little three lion cubs. I think it's because the mother is so habituated, that's why we managed to do it quite quickly. So that is a very good question, Jelly, and you're almost spot on. If a lioness does end up dying and she has cubs, if there's another lioness that has cubs, which will happen quite often in the Pride of Lions, if one lioness comes into estrus and, and looks like she wants to mate, some of the other ones might try and synchronize their breeding just for this purpose. Um, say, for instance, that mother died. There's another lioness, her sister, um, who has two cubs that we have not seen for a while. They're somewhere hidden away in this Timbavati River. And say, for instance, that lioness was killed by a male lion or an, an elephant or maybe in a, in a hunt if a buffalo bull pierces her or something and she ends up dying, there is a chance that that other lioness will wet nurse. I haven't heard that term before. It's quite interesting. But they will let the other lions suckle and, and look after them. Um, I think she will still prioritize her own cubs. These cubs will have a bit of a bit more of a challenging time growing up but they will she will allow them to suckle on her she might not pay much as much attention to them and, and always focus on rearing them because they tend to focus mainly on their own cubs and their own cub safety and so yeah there's a chance that it might might look after it I know they do suckle on each other 
But I think with these lions falling asleep and being very, very lazy in the riverbed, it's been lovely to watch them suckle. But I think what we'll do from here is head back onto the, the southern bank of the Timberwati and start making our way slowly back towards the east. But for now, we're going to send you over to Pinda. Welcome back to Pinda. The morning has heated up quite substantially since we were last with us. We unfortunately didn't have any luck with our lions, but on our way back along a similar route to where we went earlier, but not the same one, we have found our elephant. It's the same one, or one of the same ones rather, that we saw earlier. And he is in must. So something we didn't notice earlier was the wet, wet legs. I thought it smelt a bit musty, but didn't see anything to indicate that. Let's move a little bit forward here. And now that he's much more in the open, we can really get a nice... Well, if you smell, you can get a nice smell. You can see his back legs there, they're wet, there's urine dribbling down, which is something that will happen quite continuously when an elephant's in musks. So there's a giraffe and a, it's just come out the bush. Oh. King of the jungle is the elephant, not the giraffe. <laughs> chatting earlier about who's the real king of the jungle. We decided it must be an elephant. Giraffe wasn't sticking around to find out who was bigger or stronger. Quite quick to move out the way. So this bull, he's been, when we came across him, he had pushed over a tree and blocked the road. Now he's kind of, seems like he's moving between little shady spots. Um, not feeding nearly as much as he was earlier. You'll notice that the grass in this area is slightly, it's quite a lot more dead actually. A lot more brown than it was in the previous area. And he's now kind of in the bottom of a valley. There's about to come across a couple pan systems. So I'm not sure if there's any water left in these pan systems now. Oh, round and round the bush with the giraffe. Like I said, not sure if there's water in these pans, but if he keeps going down, he'll get to a huge watering hole in probably about a less than a kilometre. And at that watering hole, he'll most definitely find some water, which as the day heats up, is going to be an important find, I think. All right, he looks like he's gone behind the bush there. Class was quite much deep, actually. Small area here. Obviously, a little bit of water over here, but it is quite muddy and dirty water. I have rather than dirty water. So I'm sure this individual knows that there's water here. And I'm sure that he knows what quality it is as well. So let me just have a look. Up oh, there he is. A very nice view of his tusks now. So, so little braces. If that was a thing. We can see just out of his temples as well, just between his ear and his eye, his eye and his ear, excuse me. There's some secretions that are coming out there. It's another sign of distress in elephants or might be in must. And we are going to leave him to carry on. We are going to go check that watering hole I was mentioning about. 
now that it's warming up, I think a lot of animals will be heading in that direction. And we'll see you in a little bit. Hmm, well, sorry, Toby. I don't know how I hit that stump there, but... Davi hates it when I hit stumps, but I don't always see them. Well, everybody, we've left our, um, our Columba with her little cub. Uh, we've closed the sighting. It's going to be a negative lock. It's going to be something that we can check on every now and again. I'm chatting with Rexon when I get back to camp. Obviously, it's important that these den sites are, are kept very sort of... It must be very sensitively managed. So obviously you call it in on the radio, everybody would love to come and see a leopard cub, but you call it in and you say, listen, it's closed. And our uh, management can make whatever decisions they see fit. But the good thing about that den site is that they're probably about 40 meters away from where you can get access. So it's not even... The, the problem with sensitivity is sometimes people try and go a bit too close, but I don't think there's any possibility there, which is good. Unless you want to get stuck properly, properly ensconced in that drainage line. Feel very fulfilled though after that. Very fulfilled. I think we've earned our breakfast now, Darby. We're going to have the radio, the slowest side of the hand, and send you a light. Well done, Klalamba. We've been all suspicious for a very long time, and as I mentioned yesterday, the behavioral changes, the sort of it was really interesting watching that journey of when her behavior started to change and what followed. And it's been amazing to know that she's given birth. But yesterday, the suckle marks, a very, very low hanging, sort of lower abdomen suggesting definitely she'd given birth. Oh, Kalamba. Maybe Steve will be kind enough to give us Rusty this afternoon. I think I'm going to steal Rusty. Steve can go on Wendy. Come on, Wendeline, you can do this. So we are just bumbling back into the center of Juma now. We left the elephants. And see what else we can find, although the morning heat has really picked up here. It's incredibly hot. So as you can see, Tlalamba was on that kill for two, three days. They don't always return back to the cub, even though the cub, I believe, is very, very young. She has to stock up on her energy. She also has to hunt, make the kill, then eat to replenish that energy, then rest, of course, because she's full, then eat again to get more energy to then return to her cub and ensure that she's producing really nutritious and delicious milk. I'm sure she is. <laughs> AFC, are you still there? I just want to check. I'm having some comms problems this morning. Victoria, you're saying send the horn and the bear has been born. Yes, absolutely. 
And I think Rexham was right all that a long, long time ago when we found the track marks of mating female and male leopard. You can see that they've been mating. You can just look on the sand and see what's been happening there. Then, of course, Salamba's behavior started to change. She was snarling a lot and being very uncomfortable around vehicles and she's an extremely habituated leopardess and I said immediately she's pregnant. Her body's going through changes that she has never experienced before. There's hormonal changes and although she'll sort of innately understand, it's new to Tlalamba. And she was snarling and I thought, mm, something's different, something's different and of course I'm pregnant. But then you never know, and I try not to speculate out here, of course, it's not the best thing to do. And then, of course, it got reported on the 12th of March by another guide that she had suckle marks. And yesterday, immediately at that kill, she was very, very full and low hanging. You can see that she's producing milk and mammals only produce milk naturally when they have offspring. Ah, oh, what a journey. I'm very excited to go meet this little one. And she's been secretive and that's exactly what she should do. We don't need to see a cub at two weeks old. We don't need to even see a cub at four weeks old. That's the time for the cubs to be with the mother. And that's the time that they need the most protection because they're born so altricial. So we're going to bumble back home and hopefully we may find something along the way. On the 27th of April, Wild Earth will be turning 14 years old, and we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you. And to celebrate, we will be finishing the beautiful book that we started last year that looks at the history so far. But we do need you to be part of it. Please submit your most memorable sighting, or what Wild Earth means to you, or even just your name and a comment to be included inside the book. Head over to the website to add your name and reserve your copy. And a big thank you to all of you who have contributed to the book so far. Staying one step ahead is the key to survival out in the African wild. And now you can stay in front of the pack with a Wild Earth weekly newsletter. Sign up to be a Wild Earth explorer and you will get exclusive behind the scenes stories about your favorite guides and camera operators. Information about our upcoming plans and projects will be delivered to your inbox every week before anyone else. And you can hone your guiding skills by taking part in our Identify Me Nature quizzes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. My name is Taylor McCurdy and I work for EcoTraining. I love hearing from all of the viewers. However, I particularly enjoy those of you who have been watching for a few years. Your questions are just so advanced and they really get me thinking. If you'd like to ask a question on Wild Earth, you need to register on our website. Once you've done that, head to the live safari page and submit your questions below the live feed. What are you looking at, man? That's its gangster face. It has the manners of a common variety vagabond. Look at it chewing with its mouth open like that. Welcome back to Joom, everybody, and um, it's still, um, still waves of excitement rolling over me and Darby. We're still quite overwhelmed, really. I mean, she was leading us somewhere. We kind of knew, but never really know. And then we lost her for a moment. Let's go around, big detour. And then my favorite words, as I said before, the cam up. I've got it. I'm very excited for that. Or him, sometimes he says that. 
and then clear as day without even binoculars there was this little golden bundle moving around her belly if you have any screenshots of that everybody please feel free to send them through to me we're a little bit too far off to snap any shots but that's okay I got to see her and the little cub I don't know male or female <laughs> Sharon that's become your favorite sighting oh bless well after uh, before we left actually remember the cub had moved into the thickets again it came out again and it started attacking mum's face but then they moved into the the shade there was no more view so uh, yeah very very special very special we don't need photographic evidence of it it's notched in our memories forever I think that's why I miss the Nkuhuma pride so much having um, spent so much time with their cubs and finding the lionesses and them taking us to dens it's very exciting something you know like you're seeing life unfold you know from the beginning till the new life begins it's a uh, really very very special feeling I can't really explain it we tried to discuss it last night in fireside chat but it very hard to to really put into words but um, truly blessed is essentially it truly blessed and we're very proud of that young leopard leopardess with her little cub they normally have between one and three all depends really could lose them at a young age as well but anyway uh, we hope you've enjoyed this morning's safari we've absolutely loved it it's been a leopard filled morning for myself and Darby very very excited I don't think we've seen another animal a leopard and le we've seen squirrels we've seen a few squirrels but uh, we look forward to hosting you again this afternoon. Same time, same place from all of our wonderful locations. Please have an absolutely fantastic Monday further. It's a great start to a new week. And uh, we'll see you tomorrow, sorry, we'll see you this afternoon for the Sunset Safari. We're just gonna allow this uh, excitement to wash over us a bit more. And uh, maybe it will have settled by the time you see us again, but I doubt it. Till then, good day and goodbye.